Hi. You've probably been glued to the news like we at Code Pink have for the past few days with fear and shock uh, about what's going on. We're going to be having a conversation tonight with anti-war activist and expert and uh, author of a book on Iran, Medea Benjamin. Medea, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Ariel. Uh, horrible times, but important to uh, do whatever we can to give more information to people and get people more ready for actions, which is what we're going to need in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Could you give, for anybody that hasn't been paying as close attention as you and I have, uh, a bit of an overview of what's going on recently, bringing us up to, well, up to the minute? So um, there have been so many uh, new uh, twists and turns of this conflict, but I think it's important to step back for a minute uh, and put it in context of two things. One is a lot of this started when a US contractor was killed on a base in Iraq and Trump responded uh, by attacking an Iraqi, um, it's called a popular mobilization unit and killing 25 of the Iraqi militia. Uh, first, we have to say, why was the contractor there? And in that context, we have to ask, why are there 5,200 US soldiers in Iraq? This is not counting any more troops that are being sent to the region now. Uh, and for that, we have to say, why are we in the region at all? And go back to the Bush administration's decision after the 9-11 attacks to uh, attack Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi government in 2003 and unleash a horrendous wave of sectarianism, of violence, of destruction that Iraq and the rest of the region is still reeling from. Um, it's interesting when there's so much talk about the Iranian general Soleimani that was killed and uh, the uh, discussion about all the blood of American troops he has on his hands, I think we should talk about the blood that George Bush and his administration has on their hands by having uh, committed the sin of taking our country into war on the basis of lies. So it's important just to begin with that to say, we are not in the region, we don't live in the region of the Middle East. We shouldn't have our troops there um, and uh, we shouldn't be increasing the number of troops. We should be doing just the opposite, which is what Trump did promise and is what the American people want of getting our troops out of Iraq. Of course, we have the new development today in which the Iraqi parliament voted uh, to expel the U.S. troops from Iraq. Uh, it wasn't entirely unanimous because the Sunnis and the Kurds were not in the parliament, but it's a majority Shia country and the majority of the parliament is Shia and they did vote uh, to expel the U.S. troops. We can get back into that more. So that's one framing I wanted to put on this. Well, and just to mention that 3,500 at least more troops are being deployed or have been deployed uh, since this crisis started. Now that's not to Iraq, that's to the region, but it's to uh, ironically secure the US bases that are already in the region because uh, uh, the opposite of what Donald Trump saying that he uh, ordered Soleimani to be killed um, to protect Americans, uh, the assassination of Soleimani has led to uh, the U.S. troops all over the region being sitting ducks. And so we're sending more troops to protect the troops that are already there. A lot of the news coverage is, especially when the U.S. Embassy in Iraq was under attack, um, are going back to 1979 with the Iranian Revolution and the Iran hostage crisis. But this actually goes back a bit further. 
Well, that's the other framing we have to do. We talked about the framing of Iraq, Iraq and putting it in the context of the uh, US invasion in 2003, but we also have to go way back in the case of Iran and put the framing not in 1979 at the time of the revolution and the hostage crisis, but 1953 when the US overthrew the CIA and the British uh, overthrew the democratically elected government of Iran, the government of Mohammed Mossadegh. And it's important to go back to that time because it is quite surreal to think uh, that here uh, the US has been uh, fighting to say that we need regime change in Iran and Iran needs a democratic government when they had a democratic government. They had a very liberal government uh, elected in 1951, but the problem was that it wanted to nationalize the oil so that the profits from the oil would not go to the British um, who were in charge of the oil at that time, but would go to the Iranian people. And so you can directly trace the overthrow of that government in 1953 uh, and the installation of a very repressive uh, Shah regime throughout the following decades that led to the people of Iran mobilizing to try to overthrow that repressive regime. And one of the only places where they could mobilize because it was so, um, uh, because anybody who uh, openly um, opposed the Shah would end up being killed or in prison uh, was in the mosques. And that's why in 1979, when the people of Iran uh, successfully overthrew uh, the Shah, it was the clerics, the religious community that had the upper hand uh, and that managed to then take control of Iran away from a lot of the secular uh, leftist people who were also instrumental in overthrowing the Shah. So the revolution in 1979 is a direct result of uh, the 53 coup and then ever since 1959, the US government has been opposed to that regime and has tried through all different ways, including different types of sanctions, uh, supporting separatist groups, supporting the um, a group called the Mujahideen al khalq or the MEK, uh, all different groups to try to overthrow that regime, which they obviously have not been successful in doing. Uh, it's also important to recognize that um, the regime in Iran has been uh, attacked by Israel and Saudi Arabia as well, uh, and has caused a lot of instability in the region um, because of that ongoing conflict. Um, but then we have to talk about what happened under the Obama years, which was actually the one really good thing of the Obama administration in terms of foreign policy was to finally um, move forward in terms of an agreement with Iran. In this case, it was the nuclear deal. But the nuclear deal was seen as uh, negotiations on one issue that could then lead to negotiations on other issues. And so it was a very, very critical breakthrough. Unfortunately, uh, Trump, when he was campaigning, because of his connections to Israel and Saudi Arabia, and because of the neocons that he has surrounded himself with, um, he talked about how awful that deal was. And indeed, when he came in, uh, in 2018, he ripped up that nuclear deal. That is the most recent root of the crisis today. Um, when he ripped up that deal, he imposed this extremely hard sanctions that the Iranians have been living and suffering under. And those sanctions not only say that US companies can't trade with Iran, but it says the whole world, we don't want them to trade with Iran. We don't want Iran to be able to sell a drop of its oil. And it's quite remarkable that in the first year, uh, the Iranian government basically had a policy of st quote, strategic patience, waiting to see, will the Europeans step forward and oppose these US sanctions? Um, will there be enough uh, opposition from the international community to uh, a, a allow Iran to move forward economically and relieve uh, the pain of these sanctions. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so Iran has been looking for ways to force the hand of the international community. 
And uh, that is what has led us to the situation today. But let's be clear, it is a crisis that was manufactured by Donald Trump. The nuclear deal was one that was agreed upon by the international community, UN Security Council, the European Parliament, the Chinese, the Russians, and it was a deal that was working, that Iran was abiding by, and it was Donald Trump that has caused this, this crisis. And talk about what's happened since uh, the ripping up of the deal through now and the type of patience that Iran has had. Well, there have been studies done that have shown uh, how much the economy has shrunk uh, because of the sanctions, how the value of the currency um, uh, was plummeted by 60%, uh, how it's become difficult to get access to certain uh, medicines like cancer medicines, uh, how the price of food has doubled, in some cases tripled, uh, how the middle class in Iran has been uh, so uh, decimated, and also how this has given the upper hand to the conservative elements in the Iranian regime who said from the beginning, don't uh, come to an agreement, don't negotiate with the United States because they can't be trusted. And of course, in the end, they were right. And now with this latest escalation of tensions, um, it's become so obvious we have to also say that in the last few months, there have been um, uprisings in Iran precisely because of the economic pain that people are enduring when the government increased the price of gasoline. People came out and the Iranian regime brutally repressed the protesters, uh, killing hundreds of them. And uh, if you look now to what is happening today, uh, the, the, the murder of Soleimani has uh, made all of their protests in vain uh, because now there is not a, um, a, a chance for people to come out and ask for reforms in the government. In fact, what the US has done is unify the Iranian people behind the government. If you see the huge numbers of people that have come out in the funeral procession for Soleimani, it's quite remarkable. I think there have been millions of people that have come out and that's not because the Iranian government is forcing them. It's because the people are incensed uh, that the US has done this. And we have to also recognize that Soleimani was a hero inside Iran. And yet, what made him such a hero, even if you can go all the way back to his upbringing and really who he was for, for the people? Well, I think what's important to talk about is uh, what the Quds Force was, and that is a force that was not the repressive force inside Iran. It's a force that had um, that was dealing with the uh, uh, threats to Iran from the outside. And when you see how many countries in the Middle East have been devastated by ISIS, that hasn't happened in Iran, and that's precisely because of the work of the Quds Force and Soleimani. So even to those people who hate the regime, the Iranians inside Iran who hate their own government, uh, many of them uh, felt that Soleimani was somebody who was keeping them safe. Uh, and that's why you see people rallying around uh, the funeral procession today. And um, it's quite ironic that the killing of one person has managed to bring this kind of unity uh, to the Iranian government uh, that the United States was trying so hard for so many years to divide. Before we go on, I just want to say to the folks watching on Facebook Live and the uh, around 25 people we have that called into the webinar or, or uh, got in through Zoom, if you have any questions, if you're watching through Zoom, you can type them in the question box. And on Facebook, you can put them right in the comments and we will get to question and answer uh, fairly soon. So there's one issue that we haven't come up, uh, talked about and hasn't come up in the news very much at all. Uh, and that is something that the, um, the Iraqi prime minister said during a session in parliament uh, that what happened today and he said that Soleimani was actually in Iraq at the invitation of the prime minister because there had been discussions going on 
between Iran and Saudi Arabia mediated by Iraq. Now, this is extraordinary news that Soleimani was invited in. The Trump knew he was coming in, and this was a part of a peace process. So it should be all over the news because it is shocking that the United States would take this information of an invitation that uh, our allied prime minister gave to Soleimani to talk about peace and the US using this, like the mafia would do this, um, to, uh, as a uh, way to then assassinate Soleimani. And it's, a, it's interesting to note that there have been talks be going on, uh, mediated again by Iraq, between the enemies, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, and that the US obviously didn't want these talks to happen and assassinating uh, Soleimani was a way to make sure that um, these talks did not proceed. So what does it mean? Uh, you know, people uh, were discussing the assassination of Soleimani initially as similar to the Secretary of Defense here in the US, but he's actually a much bigger deal than that. And how worried should we be um, about Iran's retaliation from this? Um, and as well, we have a question for you, which fits right into this. And uh, uh, Joseph is asking, how irrational is it for Americans to worry that Iran has nuclear weapons or is just about to have them? Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons. It has never had nuclear weapons. It's a long way away from getting nuclear weapons. but. Um, there was an announcement by Iran today uh, that they would uh, not uh, abide by uh, the portion of the agreement about the enrichment of uranium. It's interesting that they still have not withdrawn from the deal, uh, but they are uh, steadily withdrawing from obligations that they had under that deal. Now, the deal really is not in effect anymore because the U.S. has violated the deal uh, through the sanctions. Uh, but the Iranians are still, the deal is still hanging on by a thread. Uh, and yet, uh, Iran will get closer to the possibility of having nuclear weapons because they um, are uh, now going to be enriching more uranium. So any idea that uh, the U.S. is safer um, today because of the killing of Soleimani, that's another argument to say that Iran is just about ready to pull out of that deal. Now, there still are inspectors, uh, UN inspectors in Iran. And I would think that Iran at some point will say that it wants to kick the inspectors out. Uh, but they haven't done that. And they are probably at least a year away from getting a nuclear weapon. And uh, which is an incredibly patient thing that they have not yet withdrawn formally from the deal, that they have not yet kicked uh, the inspectors out. They are very much the adults in the room, especially compared to Donald Trump, who has been t tweeting today just some of the most egregious things. Uh, threats to bomb cultural sites in Iran, saying that there are 52 cultural sites. The well, bombing of sites in general. It's 52 including sites, including cultural sites. Um, and the bombing of cultural sites is in itself a war crime. Uh, Trump also tweeted out today a notification to Congress that if uh, even one American is killed, that he will retaliate uh, possibly disproportionately and that this is the notification of Congress. Now, that is and now- We have all these beautiful new weapons that uh, our military has and we will use these beautiful new weapons on them. It's just disgusting. Can you talk about the role of Congress and, and what's so problematic about Trump saying, this is your entire notification? Well, if anybody knows the constitution, it's Congress that has the uh, sole authority to authorize war, uh, not Trump. Of course, he is going to be arguing uh, that there was this imminent threat. And those who have heard the initial arguments say that it is, um, it's pretty much ridiculous. Uh, and we have seen that um, we are more in more danger today and our troops are certainly in more danger today 
Uh, so what he did to uh, relieve us from the imminent threat has just gone in the opposite direction. Uh, but uh, Congress, uh, there are members of Congress that are trying to uh, show their opposition. And maybe now would be a good time for you, Ariel, to talk about some of those initiatives in Congress. Hello. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, since this crisis started, Senator Tim Kaine has introduced a privileged war powers resolution. Uh, privileged means that it cannot be kept from going to a vote. Uh, and in that case, the War Powers Resolution would declare that Congress has to authorize the use of military force. We'd like to see that get voted on and pass through Congress overwhelmingly very quickly because we are in such a dangerous situation where things could get worse at the moment. Um, in the House, we also have uh, a bill that's been there for a while and could move forward quickly and onto the floor and that's HR 2354 and to take action on legislation. Uh, both of these are related to the war powers in the House. It's to prohibit funds from being used for military operations against Iran unless con Congress authorizes such actions. You can go to Code Pink's website, codepink.org, and I will put that uh, on the in the Facebook comments to take action and contact your senators and representative in the House and tell them to act swiftly and strongly on this. Uh, there is no time to wait at all. And I see we have uh, a couple of questions. I'm going to begin with one of them, and then we'll go on to the rest. Uh, Pardo is asking, how determined is the Trump administration uh, to putting in a puppet government in the coming months or years? And then we also have um, another question asking about how concerned Americans should be about nuclear weapons from Iran's allies. But I want to expand that to where could this go in the region? This isn't really just Iran and the US, but this is a much, even, even not even just Iran, Iraq and the US, this is a much bigger uh, crisis than that. Well, right. Um, the uh, um, issue about, oh, I'm sorry, what was the first one? How determined is the Trump oh. administration for regime? Oh, the Republic government. Um, you know, uh, Trump says he's not trying to overthrow the regime, and yet for since the time he came in, they've been trying to overthrow the regime. He's been encouraging the protesters to go out on the streets, um, been funding the opposition forces, uh, and he had Bolton in there um, who was openly calling for regime change. And there are other members of his government that have been openly calling for regime change. So even though he doesn't say it, of course, that's what they want. Um, that's not about to happen. I just mentioned that the people of Iran are more united than they have been uh, with the death of Soleimani. And there's tremendous anti-American sentiment. And so for those groups that have been trying to change the government, um, they will have less support than they have ever had in a long time inside Iran. So that's just not going to happen. Uh, in terms of what this means for the region, uh, there are uh, allies of Iran that are in I Iraq, that are in Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Yemen. They are all over the region. And a lot of them are calling for revenge as well. Um, so things will start to blow up. It's going to happen. Uh, and it's going to affect the entire region. And that's why people who live in the region are scared to death. I mean, we should be scared here in the United States, but it is quite uh, amazing that Iran has come out and said that their response is going to be on military against US military instead of civilians. They could have easily said it was gonna be anywhere and made everybody in the United States feel like they were targets. Uh, but people in the Middle East all feel that they are targets right now and are very, very concerned. And of course the families of US troops who are being sent over there now are very concerned about what it means for them. Um, but this is not 
a war that's going to take place uh, inside Iran. This is a war that could take place all over the region and could indeed come home to us in the United States. So we have a question from Andrea on Facebook, uh, kind of a frantic, what can we do? And I'm wondering in response to that, if you can talk about the mobilization last weekend, um, along with the work in Congress, what about people taking to the streets and grassroots, grassroots initiatives on the ground? So first we have to admit that the anti-war movement that was so strong during the uh, first years of the Iraq war fell apart when Obama came in. And there are much, uh, very few groups now that are um, continuing to do anti-war work. Uh, the coalitions that we have are not strong. And so it's very hard um, to gear up to the level we have to be uh, when we have had such a weak movement over these last years. Um, but given that, uh, it is amazing that in just four days time, uh, we managed with the Answer Coalition and then other groups that came on board like Veterans for Peace, uh, like the um, World Beyond War, uh, the um, uh, Popular Resistance, Voices for Creative Nonviolence, the National Iranian American Council, um, and uh, others came together and pulled off uh, in uh, over 90 cities, it now is, uh, protests. So that's quite remarkable. I think that in the beginning, Ariel, we had a goal of 20, and then we changed it to a goal of 30 cities, and then it just kept going up and up. And it is quite amazing. And some of them were very large in Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, um, in Chicago. So um, there were thousands of people that came out on the streets. Answer is estimating that the total would be close to 15,000. That's quite remarkable in four days time. Uh, and then it means we have to build from that. So what can we do? We keep having, we're gonna have to keep calling for protests. Uh, we think that in some cities, people wanna keep doing this every Saturday. There's calls for teach-ins, educational forums. There are lots of interfaith groups that are forming and, and uh, getting statements out from the different churches at the national levels, at the local levels. Um, there's people that wanna quickly get resolutions passed in their cities. Uh, and of course, there's work to be done pushing Congress people to do more. Uh, even the Democratic leadership uh, should be not only calling for uh, Trump to not escalate, but should be calling for the troops to get out of the Middle East. Uh, and that is not what most of the Democrats are calling for right now. Uh, just this last month in December, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act was passed and it had a number of amendments that could have uh, passed with it, including in, uh, invoking the War Powers Resolution to prevent a war with Iran and repealing the 2002 authorization for use of force in Iraq, which would say that we don't have uh, authorization from Congress to continue military activities in Iraq. That's also an answer to uh, a question on Zoom. But uh, even, even though those, attach those amendments were possible to get on the NDAA, the Democrats capitulated and didn't see that a single war powers amendment, not to prevent a war with Iran or not to stop US participation in the Saudi war in Yemen, ended up passing with that bill. So we need Congress to be a lot more bold now because the stakes are really, really high and this is imminent. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Ariel, because it was so shameful that they didn't fight to keep those amendments in there. We would be in a different position right now if they had um, done their job, uh, which was to get something out of this horrible NDAA, which is a military funding bill, and instead uh, gave $738 billion of our taxes over to the military. And we should understand uh, that it, as we go forward, if this goes into a full-blown war, 
um, the Pentagon will be saying that's not enough money and they're going to ask for even more, that the stocks of the weapons companies have already gone up since the killing of, of uh, Soleimani. And uh, this is when the military industrial complex goes into full gear. And there's only one way to stop them, and that's to have a strong movement in the United States, which is what we have to build up. So we talked about more days of action. We're also talking to our friends at the Stop the War Coalition in the UK and other groups uh, internationally about an international day of action. So stay tuned because I think tomorrow we're gonna set the date and it's either gonna be in two weeks or in three weeks time. And that's gonna be a very exciting time to show a global um, repudiation of Trump's escalation of violence with Iran. And I wanna remind people that you can find information about that on our website, that's codepink.org. When we announce the day for the International Day of Action, and we're going to need a lot of people uh, in the streets at that time. So that's codepink.org, as well as materials for hosting a vigil, a teach-in, um, another anti-war activity in your town. And there's other stuff going on in Congress. There's going to be hearings starting this week uh, about the crisis in Iran. And, and before we mention those, I just want to point out that as this most recent crisis began, it was weapon stocks that went up on that at that very moment. Yeah, so in terms of the hearings that are coming up, uh, if anybody is in the DC area or can get yourself to DC, we need to pack those hearings with signs, with our t-shirts with things that are visible that say no war with Iran. Uh, and we need help in doing that. We also want to have a everyday presence in Congress, in the House and the Senate, where we are going off to the Senate uh, and House offices um, to demand they take action, to do sit-ins, uh, to work with groups locally um, that we uh, simultaneously do work in local offices and in the national office to put pressure uh, on their Congress people. So there's a lot of work to do. If you can get yourself to DC, um, please do. If you can join us, any of those days will be every single day working from the cafeteria in the Rayburn office and you can come and join us anytime. And we have an activist house in DC. And if there's room in the house, uh, you can request to stay there or to visit. And you, the easiest way to do that is to send an email to info at codepink.org. And we will direct that to Pocky Wieland, who manages the house in DC. And you can sign the pledge that we have online, and that way we know that you're somebody that really cares about this issue. You're among our uh, core members, and we'll make sure to work with you, inform you of ideas that we have, but we also need to hear your ideas. And if you have ideas uh, that um, you want to get to us and can't do that tonight, uh, just write to info at codepink.org, and we would love to hear what ideas you have. One idea that somebody just sent to me is to say that we should have uh, regular protests at Trump properties um, in the US and around the world. Uh, and I think that's a great idea. So keep your ideas coming. We need to be creative. Um, we need to find ways that the media will cover them. We were uh, pleased at some of the media coverage of the protests this Saturday, but there should have been a lot more. Uh, so we have to find more ways to show that Americans are standing up against these policies. And I, we have a, a question from uh, CPT. I don't know if that's Christian Peacemaker team or just the same initials. But uh, a question about how hopeless should we feel, given how rogue this administration has gone, the, the vileness and hate in, in Donald Trump's tweets, uh, do protests really do anything? Well, it was interesting. I was thinking back on the days, I think it was 2014 or 2013, when Trump was, uh, when Obama was in power, and he said that, uh, that Assad had crossed the uh, red line in Syria um, and that uh, he was going to respond to the um, chemical attack uh, on uh, in Syria with US military uh, direct involvement and that we started an uprising of the people to say no and it was left and right coming together. 
Um, but there were differences then. There was the right in the Tea Party that was anti-interventionist and came to join us. Uh, and there was also a president who cared about uh, what the popular opinion was and uh, was going to give Congress a chance to vote on it until he realized that Congress was not going to pass it and then he didn't move forward. In this case, we have a president who doesn't give a damn what Congress says uh, and we don't have that kind of um, uh, support from the right. Uh, but we can't feel hopeless. First of all, um, we have to act. We have to do whatever we can uh, to stop a war. People say we came out in the hundreds of thousands, indeed in the millions, to try to stop the Iraq war and it wasn't successful. Um, but what, are we supposed to not show the world that we care about these issues, not try to stop Donald Trump? Remember, it is a presidential campaign, campaign coming up and Donald Trump does want to win. Some people say that this is all about the presidential campaign uh, and that this is part of his tactic of getting people to rally uh, behind him. But if we can build up enough opposition to this, um, we might actually change Donald Trump's mind. And the opposition has to be strong internally and it has to be strong globally. And the Iranian government is going to the UN as well. Um, there are many areas that we can be showing our opposition, but we have to do that uh, in the United States. It's our duty as Americans uh, to get up, stand up, to get out into the streets, to show that we are furious about what Donald Trump is doing. Hopeless is, is not going to help us. Absolutely. And I see people uh, discussing the importance of being connected to other organizations and all being involved together. And we have all got to come out and address this crisis. Well, I see that organizations that are not normally involved in the war issues are getting involved now. Groups like Move On, Indivisible, uh, the Women's March that is going to be having big mobilization on January 18th has put the war issues on the agenda. Um, so, and the group like the Democratic Socialists of America that have chapters all over this country uh, are now taking this on in a major way as well. Uh, groups. Uh, um, so we have been uh, contacted by a lot of groups and then other groups that haven't contacted us but are doing this on their own. Uh, so I think that is a very positive thing that we're seeing groups that have membership that is much larger than ours in Code Pink um, that are taking this on. Now we've been working on this for a while because uh, we and you in particular, Medea, anticipated this, sadly and unfortunately. Um, and if you could talk for a minute about the book that you wrote and let people know where to find it. It's a, it's a, a, a really nice laid out primer on the history and politics of Iran. Yes, it's called Inside Iran and it's um, a very readable book written as a kind of basic 101 uh, and important to read right now, especially the history of Iran and the West uh, and you can get that online, you can get that from Code Pink Store, you can get that anywhere online. Um, but I think it would be uh, a great primer, a good way to get started, to have a deeper understanding of the Iranian uh, society, the Iranian government, how it works, and its history, um, not only of the relations with the West, but history of its relations with the countries in the region. Wonderful. Let's see if we have any more questions. Are there other things that you can let our watchers know? Um, places people should be looking, things that people should be worried about? Well, I think that um, we are going to be having a lot more uh, webinars, uh, calls that people can be more actively involved in asking their questions. We're going to have people from the region talk to us. We have a lot of friends in Iran because we have gone there uh, many times. You, Ariel, just came back from there. Uh, and we will be talking to people in Iraq, um, in uh, people who have been involved in the US military. Um, so we'll have a number of webinars. I know the Answer Coalition that we have been working with to organize this last Saturday protest 
is going to be doing a very in-depth webinar from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. next Saturday. And I think people will learn a lot from the guests that will be on there. Uh, so education, education, education is really important so that we can counter the lies uh, that are constantly coming out from this administration. And then we can talk to our friends, our relatives, our coworkers, and help build these movements. And I would say to anybody in your uh, local place that now is the time to do uh, outreach to the faith-based communities, to the universities. There are new groups, in fact, a new student anti-war movement that is just getting off the ground and we're very excited by that. Um, we've been contacted by a lot of uh, universities just in the last couple of days uh, that wanna get involved. Now is the time to bring young people to reinvigorate the anti-war movement, to reach out to uh, other movements like the environmental movement, the Medicare for all movement, and of course the campaigns, the presidential campaigns um, to bring this up to uh, their attention and make sure that they incorporate this into their messages. Um, we have been saying for a long time that the reason there's not money for Medicare for all, for the Green New Deal, for the infrastructure we need, for free college education is but because we put so much damn money into the Pentagon and now it's going to be worse than ever. So this is a, a call to all those different organizations to get involved and to really mobilize very quickly. And anybody on this call, we need your help. So we have two questions and they're a bit connected. Uh, the first is from Martin from Jewish Voice for Peace in Washington, D.C. And he wants to know about the role that Israel played in the past and is continuing to play. And I would add uh, going into the coming weeks and months. And also Norman is asking if we could please talk about the fact that Pompeo informed Netanyahu, MBS, and the UAE before the attack, but not Congress, not the UK, not the EU. And if you could also talk about the many media reports that are coming out saying that Netanyahu and the Mossad were involved in pushing Trump, Pompeo, and perhaps the US uh, military to carry out the assassination. Well, these are important questions. And Ariel, you can help me with this because this is your uh, area of expertise. Sure. But I do want to say that uh, when we were working under the Obama administration to try to get the Iran nuclear deal passed, uh, there were groups like APAC and other um, pro-Israel groups that all of a sudden had an infusion of millions and millions of dollars that they were putting in to try to defeat the deal. And we know that Netanyahu came to the US uh, to try to uh, stop that deal from going through. And it is quite remarkable that we were, were able to overcome all of that lobbying, all of that money that was thrown in and get the Iran nuclear deal passed. But Netanyahu has uh, constantly been crying wolf about um, Iran's ability to have a nuclear weapon uh, at the very same time that Israel refuses to acknowledge uh, how many nuclear weapons it has, refuses to be part of uh, the non-proliferation treaty, and doesn't acknowledge that uh, Iran not only doesn't have nuclear weapons, but has the most stringent inspections regime uh, that any country has ever agreed to. And then I think uh, to acknowledge that Israel has been pushing the United States to bomb Iran's nuclear facilities, but also pushing the United States to get more involved in regime change uh, in uh, Iran. And it's very interesting how, uh, yes, Pompeo has had discussions with Israel uh, before talking to our own Congress uh, and how it seems like Israel um, was involved in trying to make sure that Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, did not move forward on a path of talking. And in fact, Israel has been reaching out itself to Saudi Arabia to try to solidify an alliance between them against Iran. But please add to this. Well, I would add that leading up to this current crisis, we were watching a, an escalating situation 
of Israel striking um, in Iranian targets in Syria, in Lebanon, and in Iraq, and that can, kept escalating. And I would also add that uh, Israel is right now in the middle of an election cycle. It's in the middle of two things, an election cycle, and Netanyahu has been indicted on bribery charges and is trying to get immunity from that. So like Donald Trump, he's looking for all kinds of distractions, and he's looking to win what is now the third election in Israel. And uh, he needs to win this one by a lot more. And he's learned in the past that campaigns based on fear are successful for him. So he is dancing in circles at the news of this assassination. Now that said, uh, relatively cooler heads in Israel, of which it's a very low bar and there are not many, but those with even slightly cooler heads in Israel are not responding with the same degree of excitement, but instead see the dangerousness of this assassination. Uh, while Trump did this quite flippantly and quite rashly, uh, previous U.S. presidents and previous Israeli administrations have known not to assassinate the second most important person in Iran, a sovereign country. Um, and uh, let's see, we have another question. Can we talk a little bit more about the logistics of coming to DC to lobby in person? In particular, what would the hours be? And uh, would we be available to be helpful? Well, we will be there. So we will be absolutely available to be helpful. And I would say we will be there from uh, pretty much nine to five every single day. The most important days in Congress are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, because the Congress people leave on Mondays and Fridays, although their staff is still there. So those are still uh, important um, days as well. But the most important ones are Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, we will set up a meeting place if we have enough people, we'll do a meeting place in the cafeteria of the Rayburn building in the House, as well as in the cafeteria of the Dirksen building in the Senate. So we people could come anytime during that during the day, nine to five. You have two hours free, come. If you have eight hours free, come, whatever. And we'll send you off uh, to an office to visit. So um, really, we, we need people and we need as much time as you could possibly give. Stephanie's asking what uh, John Bolton's role has been in this. Well, John Bolton's role when he was in the administration uh, was to cook up uh, precisely these kinds of things. He was always looking uh, at how to make uh, the life of Iranian people more miserable so they would rise up and overthrow their government. And uh, he came up with all kinds of ways uh, when you see the insidious uh, forms of the imposition of different sanctions uh, and the ways that John Bolton had been working with the opposition groups uh, like the Mujahideen al Khalq. Um, and now he's out of the administration, but he was one of the first ones to come and congratulate uh, Donald Trump for um, the assassination of Soleimani. Um, it's now uh, there are rumors that maybe he won't, in the impeachment uh, effort, go against Trump because he's so happy about what Trump is doing to move us closer to war with Iran. This is what John Bolton wanted all along. So I want to remind people that this is only the first of many educational series that we'll be having. We'll be doing other conversations with Medea. We'll be talking with Iranians on the ground in Iran. Uh, with Iraqis, with other experts. And also I know that there were a number of people who wanted to watch this but weren't available and we are recording it and it will be up on the Code Pink website so that you can share it with colleagues and friends. And I wanna say our website again, which is codepink.org and that on the website, you can contact your senators and representative in the House, tell them to take action quickly. You can find materials for vigils, rallies, um, teach-ins and more, and you can contact us to get more involved 
at info at Code Pink as well on our website. If you take the pledge to join a global movement against war, and that will be on the home page, then we will know that you are extra interested in this issue and want to be closely involved, and we will work with you closely. So Matias, any further off. thoughts before we uh, start winding down? Yeah, as we sign off, I think it would be nice if we both said a little, and I'd love to hear from you, um, about the Iranian people, because you were there recently, and this is really all about people. Um, how, is there anything you'd want to uh, let the people who are watching this know about what you discovered when you visited Iran? Sure, well, some of the things that uh, surprised me when I, when I got to Iran were um, just the friendliness of the people. This is despite all the horrific and horrible things that the U.S. is currently doing to that country, and yet people were so aware um, of the difference between a government and its people, and so welcoming and so vocal about their desires for peace. And I want to speak about the length and breadth of uh, the history of Iran and that the Iranian people have been through so much and they see themselves as so resilient. They have no thoughts that uh, they will be capitulating to the U.S. and do not want another country interfering in their domestic affairs even those who are incredibly critical of the government, and there are many who are and many reasons to be, they say very clearly that it is up to them to reform and build the society that they want and not something to be imposed upon them. Um, I would direct people, I wrote an article recently right before this crisis broke out on the history and political lives of the Jewish community in Iran here in the US, we're facing a horrific rise in anti-Semitism. And when I went to synagogues in Iran, so different than the US and, and so different than Europe, there were no guards out front, no locked doors, and no feeling of being unsafe. And they told me we are very well protected and respected in this society. So I did some research on the incredibly long history of Jews in Iran and those are who are there currently. And that can be found on Code Pink's website or on Common Dreams. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, the people there are asking for, the, for us in the US to do everything that we can to pull our government back, to get these sanctions lifted, to make sure that we don't go to war and are outraged at the actions taken in the past few days. Well, thank you for that, because I think it really is important to recognize um, the beautiful people of Iran, uh, the beautiful history, the incredible contributions that they've made to the world society, that our country is a little baby compared to the thousands of years of history uh, that Iran has, and that the arrogance of Donald Trump is so revolting um, when he is threatening uh, this country of 80 million people. And uh, when he talks about our beautiful weapons, um, I think of you know who will be on the receiving end, just as was the case of Iraq and the other places that the US has invaded. Um, our country is really a violent country and we have a violent, vile man in the White House right now and we have to um, do everything we can to counter him and to show the people of Iran and the people of the region um, that uh, there are people in the United States that want to live differently in the world, uh, want to have a loving relationship with the people around the world, uh, and do not think um, that the aggressive, militaristic behavior of our leaders um, ref reflects the values that we hold um, as Americans. So thanks for organizing this webinar, Ariel. And I look forward to the days ahead in which we can do a lot of mobilizing and organizing and have big, big demonstrations and 
uh, flood the halls of Congress um, so that we could try to stop the man, mad, mad man in the White House. And with that, uh, we'll sign off and we'll be back very soon. If you're not already on our email list, you can sign up on our website, codepink.org. And please also follow us on Twitter at Code Pink for up to the minute updates about what's happening and what you can do. Peace with Iran. Peace, night.